Hello, this is Dr. Hena Asil, and today we're talking about um, Unit 2, Chapter 4 in IAS at Excel Chemistry. This is talking about groups 1 and 2 elements and their reactions and um, other characteristics. So, first of all, you remember from O level that group 1 and group 2 the reactivity increases going down the group. So we said in group one, the most reactive metal is cesium. So as we go down, the reactivity increases, both in group one and in group two. What about ionization energy? Do you remember what's ionization energy? It's the energy needed to remove the outermost electron. So as we go down the group, the element becomes bigger and bigger, more shells so the electron to be removed is further away from the nucleus less attraction forces between the outermost electron and the positive nucleus so as we go down the group ionization energy is low then we need to remember the reactivity series or the order of reactivity of the metals now we had this reactivity series in uh, the O level course, but even without knowing this reactivity series, we all we said that any metal in group one is more reactive than group two. Metals in group two are more reactive than group three, and group three is more reactive than the transition metals. The one down is more reactive than the one above it. So, what kind of reactions do we need to know? We need to know reaction of metals with oxygen. Remember, if we burn any metal with oxygen, it forms the oxide. So we have sodium, for example, with oxygen would form sodium oxide. And these oxides, we said, are oxides of metals. So when we dissolve them in water, they form a strongly alkaline solution. So we said they are uh, basic oxides. And then we said, if we look at magnesium, for example, we're burning magnesium. Magnesium burns in a bright flame. It forms a white solid, which is magnesium oxide. So when we burn magnesium, it forms magnesium oxide, which is a white solid. Reaction with water. Remember that group one metals and group two up to calcium. Uh, react with cold water and we said when these reactive metals react with cold water they form hydroxide and hydrogen gas but magnesium reacts with steam so when it reacts with steam it gives magnesium oxide plus hydrogen so if we look at sodium when I put a piece of sodium in a beaker containing cold water, first of all, we should know that it will give sodium hydroxide plus hydrogen. And that means, what do I observe? Well, sodium is in group one. They are low density metals, so the sodium will float. The bubbles of hydrogen will push the sodium around, so it will dart. And then once it reacts, it starts to disappear or dissolve or melt. This is a reaction that gives out hydrogen. Sodium is a reactive metal, so it gives out vigorous fizzing due to the bubbles of hydrogen gas. And these bubbles of hydrogen gas may catch fire. Remember that sodium hydroxide is formed, so the solution is alkaline. So if we put litmus paper, it turns to blue. What if I put in calcium? Now, calcium is in group 2. It still reacts with cold water to give calcium hydroxide plus hydrogen, but then it's in group 2, so it is higher density. So what I see is, first of all, the calcium sinks, and it still gives hydrogen gas, so I will see strong fizzing or bubbles of gas. And the calcium hydroxide that is formed is not very soluble in water, so the solution becomes are we all following now when i pass steam over magnesium steam of course is water that has been heated so i have a cotton wool with water and i heat it the steam passes over the heated magnesium what is formed is the magnesium oxide plus hydrogen and you should know that magnesium burns with a bright flame 
the magnesium oxide that is formed is a white solid or we call it white ash and the hydrogen gas formed will burn on the other side of the tube when we talk about reaction with chlorine you should know that metals in group one or group two reactive metals will react with chlorine to form chloride and these are ionic compounds so they will form an ionic crystal letter the chlorides when we dissolve them in water they will give ionic solutions so keep that in mind for future reference reactions with acids metals react with acids to form salt and hydrogen gas so a reactive metal in group one and group two will displace the uh, hydrogen from the acid and form a salt plus hydrogen gas this is seen as bubbles of gas of course group one and group two are mostly reactive metals so there will be lots of bubbles the amount of bubbles is an indication of the reactivity of the metal so a less reactive metal will give less bubbles of gas now metal hydroxides when they react with acids they give salt plus water so the metal gives salt plus hydrogen the metal hydroxide gives salt plus Let's talk about the trends in solubility of the group two compounds. First of all, you have to realize that a hydroxide atom is small, or atomic group is small. Carbonates, sulfates, nitrates are larger atomic groups. Now, keep in mind, if something is small and it is bonded to something that is also small, the bond is very strong and it will be more difficult to dissolve it and more difficult for it to react. But if I have one of them is a small atom, the other is a large group, then the, it is easier to separate them. It's easier for them to react. Uh, and we will explain why in a minute. But for now, just keep in mind that if we're talking about hydroxide, hydroxide itself is a small atomic group small at the top with a metal or atom that is small this is less soluble less reactive also when i bind the hydroxide to a larger atom at the bottom it is more soluble more reactive now if we're talking about carbonate sulfate nitrates these are large atomic groups then if you put them with a small atom at the top of the group then it is more soluble, more reactive. The one down, carbonates are large atoms. If they are with the large atoms at the bottom of the group, they are less soluble, less reactive. Are we paying attention? The same for the thermal stability. So carbonates, first of all, if we're talking about carbonates, do we understand the meaning of thermal stability? Something that is thermally stable means it does not break down by heat. So when we heat it, it remains as it is. So for example, we will say that group one carbonates are thermally stable. Thermally stable means if we heat them, they do not decompose. But group two carbonates would decompose and they would give magnesium oxide, for example, plus carbon dioxide. So the carbonate of group 2, when we heat it, it gives the oxide plus carbon dioxide gas. Now, we said which ones are more stable or which ones are less reactive and so on. We said if something is more stable, then it is less reactive. If something is less stable, then it is more reactive. It decomposes easily. And we said also that if we have a big atomic group like carbonate put it with a small atom like magnesium it will react easily dissolve easily less thermally stable so it will decompose easily if you heat it put the carbonate with a big atom like the ones at the bottom of the group barium for example then this is a more stable compound more stable means it does not break down if you heat it or less likely to break down when you heat it and uh, less reactive because it will not break up easily now the question now is why this has to do with the ion polarization if you remember 
from unit one, we talked about iron polarization and we said, for, for example, if I have magnesium carbonate, for it to react, I need the carbonate ion to break up. Now, if I have a small atom with a big charge like Mg2+, there will be more ion polarization. The electron cloud in the carbonate ion will be distorted and this will make it easier for it to break up. So it will be easier to form magnesium oxide plus carbon dioxide. So the smaller the positive ion, the higher the charge density and therefore you will have um, polarization, distortion of the electron cloud on the negative ion so that it breaks up more easily. If we're talking about nitrates, you have to remember, group 1 nitrates will decompose, they will break up, but they will form nitrite plus oxygen. Remember, this is NaNO2 is sodium nitrite plus oxygen. All This happens for all group 1 except lithium. Now, lithium nitrate will break up into three, lithium oxide, nitrogen dioxide, and oxygen which is similar to what happens in group two. So the lithium nitrate breaks up like group two nitrate, which is to give the oxide plus nitrogen dioxide plus oxygen. While the group one, when nitrates, when they are heated, they break up to form the nitrite plus oxygen. Okay. Now, let's remind ourselves about flame tests. We've talked about this in O-level, but here we, we need to be able to explain why can we see colors. Remember that we said a flame test means I'm going to heat a metal ion in Bunsen burner flame, or what we call the non-luminous flame of the Bunsen burner. Okay, what is happening? You should realize that the salt is, when the salt is heated, it absorbs energy. Now, when it absorbs energy, electrons in lower energy level will absorb this energy and jump to a higher energy level. This is called excited state. The atom does not want to remain like that. The electron wants to go back to its original energy level. When it goes back to its original energy level, it emits the amount of light that it absorbs. And if this emission is in the visible spectrum, then we can see a characteristic color. And remember that different metals have gaps of different sizes between their energy levels. So they would emit light of different wavelengths. And this gives different colors for the different metals. Now, if something does not give a color, like magnesium, Magnesium, if it's heated, it does not give a color. That is because the light that is emitted is not in the visible region. So we don't see a color. You should know that in order to do a flame test, uh, we need to clean a platinum wire by dipping it into concentrated hydrochloric acid, then insert the platinum wire into the solution to be tested, then insert the solution into the non-luminous part of the flame and determine the color obtained. And you should learn the colors that we get for the different ions. Remember, these are the metal ions, not metals in themselves. So this is lithium ion, Li+. If we do this with a lithium compound, the, we will get a red color. A sodium ion in a sodium compound will give yellow. Potassium ions give lila. In group 2, calcium will give brick red. Strontium gives red that is, well, we say it's red like lithium, but actually it's a little bit different. But you should remember that lithium and strontium give red. Barium gives a green or what we call apple green or light green color or pale green. So these are the colors that you're supposed to learn. Remember again, magnesium gives no color because the light emitted is not in the visible region. Another thing that we need to know was the test for ions. So we have, this is from O-level also. Remind, remind yourselves, we said to test for carbonate. If I want to know if this salt has carbonate or not, 
then I can add an acid like dilute hydrochloric acid. If it's a carbonate, it will give off bubbles of gas that turn lime water milky because it gives out carbon dioxide gas. Uh, when we have halides, chloride, bromide, iodide, we said we can add dilute nitric acid and silver nitrate. This will give white precipitate for chloride, cream precipitate for bromide, yellow precipitate for iodide. But if you notice, the colors are very near to each other. It's very difficult to determine if what I have is actually white or cream or yellow. So this year we have to do another test on the precipitate that we get. You should realize that if I have a chloride, it will give a white precipitate soluble in dilute ammonia. So that means that when I get the precipitate, I add a little bit of dilute ammonia. If the precipitate disappears or dissolves, then I have chloride. Now, a cream precipitate of bromide, if we add dilute ammonia, nothing happens. It does not dissolve in dilute ammonia. But if I add concentrated ammonia, it would dissolve. So if the precipitate that is obtained does not dissolve in dilute ammonia, but dissolves in concentrated ammonia, then it is bromide. The iodide should give me a yellow precipitate. Now, if I add ammonia, it will not dissolve in dilute or in concentrated ammonia. So if the precipitate remains after we add concentrated ammonia, then that was iodide. Please pay attention to these uh, tests. Sulfate is exactly the same as what we did last year. We said add dilute nitric acid and barium nitrate or uh, hydrochloric acid and barium chloride. And this gives white precipitate. Remember that we're adding the acid to remove any carbonate that may be present because we said if we have carbonates, they would give me a white precipitate with the barium uh, nitrate or the barium chloride so we need to remove the carbonate by adding acid first so that the white precipitate I get is due to sulfate not carbon test for ammonium ions again we said we have to distinguish are we testing for ammonia gas or ammonium ions which is actually ammonia dissolved in water and aqueous solution of ammonia so if we have an aqueous solution of ammonia or ammonium ions, we should add sodium hydroxide solution, warm gently. And we said if we do that, we get bubbles of gas that turn damp red litmus paper to blue because it gives ammonia gas. So the test for the ammonia gas is insert damp red litmus paper. It turns blue. Remember that we said to test a gas with litmus paper, the litmus paper has to be damp because litmus paper works only if there is water somewhere. So either you put it into a solution, no problem, or if you're using it to test the gas, then the litmus paper itself must be damp. Test for carbon dioxide, we said bubble the gas through lime water, it turns milky. You should realize that why it turns milky, this is because the lime water is actually calcium hydroxide solution. Now, if I pass the carbon dioxide through the calcium hydroxide solution, it gives calcium carbonate, and calcium carbonate does not dissolve in the solution, so we get it as a white precipitate that shows the solution turning milky. Test for chlorine gas. Again, remember, are we talking about chlorine gas or chloride ions? Chloride ions was the test with silver nitrate. Chlorine gas, I insert damp litmus paper, it bleaches, and we said bleaches means the litmus paper, uh, the color is removed, so it becomes white. Testing for hydrogen gas and oxygen gas, we said if I'm testing for hydrogen gas, I insert a lighted flint. That means my match is lighted, I put it into hydrogen, the result is it pops. Now, to test for oxygen, I need to insert a glowing splint. We said a glowing splint is one in which I lighted the splint, but I turned it off just a little bit. So it's glowing. If I insert it into oxygen, it will relight. Okay, thank you for listening. I hope this was useful to you. And next time we'll do questions and answers on this chapter.